in listen-only mode. Welcome to this evening's Family Support Center of New Jersey's webinar titled Support Coordination, What Every Family Needs to Consider, part of the Transition Matters webinar series. I would like to introduce this evening's presenter, Trace Baxter, the Assistant Director of Training at Caregivers of New Jersey. Welcome, Trace. Hello and welcome to Support Coordination, What Every Family Needs to Consider. Can everyone hear me okay? Trace, I think you're good. Okay, great. Okay, we'll start our presentation. Again, I'll repeat, this is Caregivers of New Jersey Support Coordination, What Every Family Needs to Consider. This is going to be an overview of what individuals and their families should think, be thinking about in regards to choosing a support coordination agency. My name is Trace Baxter and I'll be presenting today's web event. I'm the Assistant Director of Training and Quality Assurance for Caregivers of New Jersey, which offers support coordination services, and I'm very excited to have you join me in today's presentation. Before we begin, let's take a few minutes to go over how you can participate during today's web event. You each have your own control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that looks similar to the one here. You can use the orange arrow highlighted by the the rotating square to open or hide your control panel. To listen to the webinar, you have two audio options. To choose from mic and speakers and telephone. If you can't hear well doing your during <coughs> If you can't hear well using your computer speakers, you can elect to use your telephone to listen to the webinar. In order to maintain the best sound quality possible, all but the presenter will be muted throughout the webinar. If you have questions or comments, you can submit them using the questions panel. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Okay, let's start by reviewing today's webinar objectives. We plan to discuss what individuals should do first to ensure a smooth transition, define a support coordination agency, working with a support coordination agency, discuss the support coordinator's responsibilities, questions to ask a support coordination agency, questions to ask a support coordinator, discuss the individual's responsibilities, resources, hold one moment please, discuss the individual's responsibilities, resources for finding services, and provide time for questions and answers. What individuals should do first? DDD eligibility. If you have not already been deemed eligible for DDD, which is the Division of Developmental Disabilities, contact your DDD Community Service Office or start the application process through the DDD website at the web address listed below. In regards to Medicaid eligibility, DDD's eligibility regulations now require that an individual also be eligible for Medicaid. Information on Medicaid eligibility as it relates to DDD is available at the website below or the web address below. If you need assistance with applying for Medicaid or have not been able to become eligible, Complete the Medicaid eligibility troubleshooting form available on the website provided above and send it to the following web address. When it comes to DDD eligibility and Medicaid eligibility, as I stated previously, you have to be qualified for both with the Division of Developmental Abilities to actually move forward in the program of self-direction. 
The DD eligibility, as I have mentioned before here, literally all you have to do is to contact your DDD community service office and let them know that you want to become DDD eligible for services for your loved one or the individual that you're planning to support. When it comes to Medicaid eligibility, since the state has switched over to having Medicaid reimburse them for the dollars that they're spending on the self-direction programs, you do have to become Medicaid eligible or have it already in effect so that it will not hinder the process of moving forward and seeking services. So after you become DDD eligible and Medicaid eligible, what the individual should continue to do is research providers. You should plan for the life course, as we call it. It is always easier to identify support needs and access services more quickly when planning has been done prior to exiting the school system. You can use the Person-Centered Planning Tool, or PCPT, to help you with this process. It's available at the following web address. You can actually download the PCPT and start um, the process of filling out the paperwork that is needed so that you can align all your services or the expected services into place. Discuss your vision for life when school is over by using this PCP tool that they offer you. Think about where you might work, live, and what supports you may need. Moving on to this next slide, what individuals should do. First, we're going to continue to say that what you should be doing is participating in planning for adult life activities. Training, information, resource materials, and webinars will be offered through DDD's Planning for Adult Life project. This project will be conducted by the Ark of New Jersey and the Community Access Unlimited. Activities for students between the ages of 16 through 21 and their families include but are not limited to the following. Training sessions focusing on topics such as post-secondary education or employment, housing, legal and financial information, self-direction, health and behavioral health, and friends and social connections. Information about events and activities will be available on the DDD website at the following address, www.planningforadultlife.org. Moving on to what you should do next is complete the Developmental Disabilities Resource Tool, or DDRT. You will hear the term DDRT a lot because basically it is a survey in which the division is able to determine what type of budget that your loved one will be assigned. Correspondence including information about accessing and completing the survey has been sent to most of the 2014 graduates. If you have not received the letter, please reach out to your regional office to update your contact information. The DDRT can be completed online or via phone call. Please note, when competing, completing the DDRT online or via phone call, don't brag about the things the person can do. If you assist the person in any way, please don't say the person is independent. This will provide false information about what the person can and cannot do. If assistance is needed, then state it. Complete Support Coordination Agency Select Form is next in the process. The ability to choose a SCA or Support Coordination Agency is a new experience for most. To choose an SCA, all you have to do is complete a Support Coordination Agency selection form that can be accessed from the Division's website at the following address. If you do not know of any Support Coordination Agencies, a list of approved Support Coordination Agencies can be accessed on the Supports Program Provider Portal at the following address. If you have a preference for working with a particular Support Coordination Agency, you may choose one from the list of providers who have been approved by the Division to offer Support Coordination Services. 
If you do not have a preference or if the agency that you choose does not provide services within your county and or does not have the capacity to provide you with services at this time, the division will auto assign you an agency. You will have the option of changing your agency after 30 days of service. Sixty days prior to graduation, you want to make sure that you complete and submit the Support Coordination Agency Selection Form to the Division. The Support Coordination Agency Selection Form can be emailed to the following address, or it can be mailed to the New Jersey Division of Developmental Disabilities at the following mailing address. According to what DDD has announced to us, they will start allowing support coordination agencies work ahead of time with individuals and families so that they can hope to encourage a smooth transition from school to adult life. So the sooner that you're able to choose your support coordination agency and get them on board, the sooner we can start planning for the services that you're looking to purchase. So let's talk a moment about what is a support coordination agency. A support coordination agency is an organization qualified by the Division of Developmental Disabilities, or DDD, to provide services that assist individuals in gaining access to needed program and state plan services, as well as needed medical, social, educational, and other services. There are several support coordination agencies now available throughout the state. All have been qualified by DDD. So again, if you don't know of a support, coordination, a support coordination agency you would like to choose, you can download the list from ZDD's website that was mentioned previously on another slide. Later in this presentation, we will actually go through and provide some questions that you will need to ask the um, support coordination agency, as well as the support coordinator that will be assigned to you. So why should you choose a support coordination agency? In order to access services funded by the New Jersey Division of Developmental Disabilities, you will need to have a support coordination agency. Choosing a support coordination agency can make it possible for individuals and their families to, one, match the individual's wants and needs with the skills and expertise of the support coordination agency, two, find an agency that knows the individual's local community and supports that exist, Three, select an agency with which they feel comfortable working. Four, discuss what is expected from someone providing support coordination services. And five, change to a different agency if the need arises. Let's look back over these for just a moment. When it comes to matching the individual's wants and needs with, with the skills and expertise of the support coordination agency, there's a lot of actual planning that goes into this type of <coughs> research. We want to make sure that we match the individual with the types of services or the agencies that are pro providing the services, and we want that match to be a good match because these will be the actual agencies that will be providing the supports. You also want to make sure that you choose an agency that knows the individual's local community and the supports that exist within that community. A lot of times the support coordination agencies will say that they are statewide, which means that they can service any individual in the state of New Jersey. However, if they do not know the local um, community resources and supports, then it will be hard to match that individual to those supports and services. And that could actually delay the individual from receiving the supports and services they, that they need at that moment. When it comes to selecting an agency with which they feel comfortable working with, even though you do have the option to change to a different support coordination agency at a later date, you want to try to make the first successful connection. By working with your support coordination agency and the support coordinator which is assigned, you can actually create a learning environment that not only can the individual learn from, but the support coordinator can learn from. Discuss what is expected from someone providing support coordination to ser um, services. You may want to ask the support coordination agency for any type of referrals to other people that they may be offering services to. The support coordination agency should have a list of individuals that are willing to talk to you or your loved one about the services they're receiving from that support coordination agency. If they don't, 
if they don't, then you may want to ask them specifically to come up with some of those referrals. And last but not least, as part of self-direction, you have the opportunity to change to a different agency if the need arises. Please keep in mind, though, if you run into a problem with your support coordination agency, you should always try to work things out with them first. And if things doesn't seem to be able to move forward in a positive direction, then by all means, you can request to have that agency changed to another agency that is on the approved support coordination agency list. Working with a support coordination agency. Once you've selected an agency and submit your um, su support coordination agency selection form, the division will enter the information into its system once it is received and they will notify the support coordination agency. From the date that the support coordination agency is assigned, the support coordination agency will have 30 days to work with you to complete your New Jersey Individualized Service Plan or otherwise known as the NJISP. It is important to note that an NJISP must be completed within 30 days of assignment to a support coordination agency. That is their deadline. They are supposed to write the NJISP along with the PCPT, which is the person-centered planning tool, and connect you with services and have those services started within the 30-day period. This, requi this requires cooperation and commitment of the participant and or of the family and the support coordination agency to attend meetings and work closely together to identify the appropriate services and supports that will be used to create the NJISP. If you and or your family cannot commit to this time frame or services are not needed at this time, please hold off in submitting this form until you are ready to move forward. Once the support coordination agency is assigned, that 30-day period or timeline is actually initiated. The clock, the clock starts, as we call it. And therefore, if we don't have a plan in place within 30 days, then DDD will be contacting us, asking us, what is the delay? And by all means, we don't want to have to say in any circumstance that it was the family that has, is, has become the barrier in moving forward with services. What do support coordinators do? Support coordinators complete a variety of responsibilities in partnership with the individual, his or her family, the Division of Developmental Disabilities, and service providers, which include the following. Introducing the individual to the process of person-centered planning and self-direction. Introducing the individual to person-centered planning and self-direction is a new process that a lot of families are not familiar with. Person-centered planning pers puts the person in the center of everything that's going on, making them the most important person throughout the whole planning process. We want to know the person's hopes, their dreams, things that they want to do in life. Do they want to get a job? Do they want to go to a day service? Do they want to explore their community? Would they like to volunteer at a job? So. By putting that person in the center of the process, we're able to gather that information and move forward in the self-direction process. Now, the self-direction process is also new for a lot of people here in New Jersey. Self-direction basically means that you self-direct yourself. If there is any type of services that you want or desire, and as long as they fall within the guidelines of the initiative that you're in, then by all means, we want that we want that individual to direct themselves towards those services and make those um, type of decisions for themselves. Or their family members can also assist them in making those decisions. But again, self-direction is a process in which the individual or the family actually directs themselves along the path of receiving supports and services. Identifying the individual support needs and preferences. We mentioned earlier about the New Jersey Centered Planning Tool, which is mentioned in the next bullet, but the person-centered planning tool actually captures that information. And it also helps us identify what the individual support needs and preferences are. So moving on to the next bullet, developing the New Jersey person-centered planning tool and the New Jersey individualized service plan, basically are one step together. By completing the PC, PT and the NJISP were able to 
capture a full picture of what the individual wants to do in their life. And using the NJISP basically sets that in motion. It is a document that allows us to enter the services into what we call the iRecord, which is a program that DDD has set up for us to enter the service in and pay for those services through the fiscal intermediary, which is also the Easter Seals of New Jersey. But by developing this ISP, we can actually map out those services, make sure they're being paid for, and also know if any services are being overlapped or duplicated. Next, providing information about the range of services and supports available. Your support coordinator is a wonderful resource, and they can provide you with all the information that you need about the different services that are available out in the community and throughout the states. We also can help you in finding um, what we call self-hires or individuals who may not be with certain agencies. They are individuals who have decided to help people in this process by supporting them either in personal care, transportation, volunteering, and other activities that can be taken um, out in the community. Locating options for services that include traditional disability providers, generic community supports, government supports beyond DDD, and or natural supports based on funds available in the individual budget. As we discussed earlier, the DDRT, which is, the, which is basically a tool that's used to gauge how much an individual's budget will be, we are able to sit there and map out all the different types of services that can be purchased with that budget. And to look at some of these services, as I've already read, the traditional disability providers would be the type of providers that offer day services or facility-based day services that your loved one can attend. Generic community supports would be any type of supports that are not paid for by your DDD budget, but all from an alternate funding source. Government supports beyond DD, we, have, we do have supports available that DDD offers through what they call the family support area. So if you are looking for a service that your budget may not um, cover, then we could reach out to family support services and request for those services to be paid for by the state. We may not always get what we want in regards to the payment of services, but it never hurts to ask. And lastly, the natural support. Natural supports are what would be supports that are not paid for by the budget. And those type of supports would be any type of support that is provided by a parent, a guardian, a family member, or a friend. A lot of times families will want to end up paying their friends and so forth for some type of service or support that they're receiving. However, we try to discourage families from doing that because if you end up paying somebody who's already offering something for you for free, then basically you're nipping that in the bud, so to say, and you're going to have to start paying for that service out of your budget. And that money that's in your budget can be used for other services that necessarily um, are needed for the actual function of out, uh, being out in the community. Ongoing monitoring and supports of services. Your support coordinator is your support coordinator. The only time you would ever lose a support coordinator is naturally if the individual or family would like to request another support coordinator or if the support coordinator stops working for the support coordination agency that you're currently enrolled in. That support coordinator should constantly be monitoring the services supports that are in the plan of care or that are in the ISP, which is the Individualized Service Plan. They also should be monitoring the budget, too, to make sure that there is no overpayment of services or if you become overbudgeted to where there is no more money left in the budget to purchase the needed services in the future. Responding to emergencies and other service-related needs of the individual and or family. Through the programs that DDD is setting up now, the support coordinator is basically taking the place of your case manager. So anytime there's an emergency and you need to reach out to your support coordinator, please do because the support coordinators do have what we call on-call situations to where someone is covering that support coordinator's clients. And if they need to contact the support coordinator for additional information to address any type of emergency that's happened, then they can do so. 
empowering the individual to remain in charge of their plan. Through self-direction, this is something that support coordinators are constantly doing. We try to empower the individual to make their own decisions and also to direct the course that they choose to take in regards to purchasing services and supports for their life. Are there specific questions to ask? There are a lot of specific questions that we need to be asking. So now let's talk about some of those necessary questions that need to be asked of support coordination agencies, as well as the support coordinator. Basic information. We're going to break down each one of these questions, and I'm going to attempt to give you a good answer back for these so that you'll have something to gauge um, the answers that the support coordination agencies may be giving back to your questions. How many individuals do you provide support coordination services to? For a support coordination agency, they could have hundreds of people that they actually are um, providing support coordination services for. However, each of the support coordination agencies should have support coordination, I mean, excuse me, support coordinators employed so that they have a basic caseload. The caseload will depend upon the support coordination agency themselves. Some, for example, caregivers of New Jersey, our typical caseload does not exceed a number of 45 individuals. However, I have heard of other support coordination agencies giving 60 plus individuals over to their support coordinators. So you need to keep in mind that if you ask them what is the typical caseload of one of their support coordinators, and if it is a very high count, it could delay in you getting some of the attention that you deserve. So make sure that you choose an agency that has support coordinators with a lower caseload so they're able to give you the time and attention that you deserve. What is the average turnover of a support coordinator at your organization? This is a very important question to ask support coordination agencies. If they constantly have new support coordinators coming into their agency and others leaving, then you're possibly going to see a new support coordinator be reassigned to you on a regular basis. And one of the things that we try to discourage is that a support coordinator, when they're assigned, should work with the individual and the family so that they can get to know that individual and know their hopes and dreams and know what they want to accomplish in life. And if you have a support coordinator that has stayed with you for several years, they basically can become part of the family, so to say, and they will know the individual well enough that if they hear of something that is going, out in the, going on out in the community or a service that's just been introduced, if they know that individual can benefit from it, they can introduce that service or those type of activities out in the communities for that individual to take advantage of. You may want to ask, how do you match individuals using supports with support coordinators? A lot of times support coordination agencies will, if they have the capacity to do so, will assign a support coordinator that's based in the region or area or even the county that the person is living in. That way they're easily accessible when needed and also when it comes to contact in the agency, a lot of times families and individuals will have a tendency to avoid calling agencies that have a different area code. However, here in the state of New Jersey, as with our agency, um, it doesn't matter what the area code is whatsoever. The, the support coordinator has access to everyone who is on their caseload. You also, in regards to this question, you may want to consider, too, that support coordination agencies may end up matching the individuals <coughs> um, to the support coordinator in regards to maybe cultural beliefs, anything like that where they think that the support coordinator will get along with the individual and the family and become one working unit. Another question that you may want to ask support coordination agencies is how long have you provided services in New Jersey or in this region? Some support coordination agencies were just created within this past year, and there are other support coordination agencies that's been out there doing support coordination for the past seven years. So just keep in mind that if you have an agency that has, is well established, those agencies are usually the ones that are going to have the best connection of resources and know what is going on with the state as well as the processes of dealing with DDD. 
Another question you may want to ask is how does your agency respond to issues or needs that occur after typical business hours? I mentioned this briefly um, earlier that most support coordination agencies, well really all support coordination agencies, are required to have an on-call person. So any time after hours if there is an emergency or there is a need for a service that may not have already been planned for, then you could be able to you should be able to call that support coordination agency, find out who's on call, and speak to a support coordinator. It may not be your actual support coordinator, but that support coordinator who is on call will be able to forward that information to your support coordinator, and they will be able to pick up where the on-call support coordinator left off. There are still more questions to ask support coordination agencies. Moving on, we're going to cover an area called knowledge and experience. Our first question is, how would you describe the experience of your support coordinators have working with individuals with disabilities? A lot of times when support coordinators are brought on to support coordination agencies, some may have experience working with individuals with disabilities and others may not. However, a lot of the support coordinators go through many different types of trainings and are exposed to many different people to the point to where by the time they're able to actually start carrying a caseload, they do have the experience that is needed to be an effective support coordinator. What training and mentoring do your support coordinators receive to give them the knowledge and skills needed to help my family member obtain the supports and services needed to live the life she or he wants? Again. There is basic training that all support coordination agencies have to go through and they require their support coordinators to go through that basic training also. So at a base level, all support coordination agencies are starting out fresh and are all, on the, all are on the same level. However, if you was to go with a support coordination agency that has actually been established for quite some time, you may find out that those support coordinators have gone through even more extensive training because of their employment throughout the years with that support coordination agency. I'm not going to say that one agency, that a fresh starting agency would have less resources or even less training than an established one, but just like when any circumstance, if you choose somebody who has experience, then that experience usually shows itself. How do your support coordinators develop or adapt services and supports to address the needs and preferences of culturally diverse communities? Most support coordination agencies should keep in mind that any time they are assigning an individual to their support coordinators, they do have to have that matching quality, so to say. And one of those matching qualities would be if the, if the support coordinator themselves are aware of the culture and beliefs of that individual. If they do seem to align, that is, that is one of the ways that a lot of the support coordination agencies will try to connect their support coordinators with the individuals that they are serving. To give you an example, I know of one situation to where a support coordinator was assigned to a Jewish family who was very um, strict in following their Jewish beliefs. So by doing so, we um, the agency actually chose a support coordinator who had the background dealing with the um, Jewish faith and they in no way um, offended the family in any way because they already knew the practices that they needed to actually um, practice. How are your support coordinators connected with the local community and resources? Again, I mentioned earlier that most support coordination agencies will say that they are statewide and that they can offer services in all counties here in the state of New Jersey. And that is, that, that is to be true. Even my agency does the same. However, by situating the support coordinators in the same regions or even in the same um, counties, the support coordinators are able to basically teach themselves on all the resources and the, and the services that are available within that region or county. And that way they're able to connect the individuals they serve right with the type of services that are local to them. How do you educate and empower individuals and families about the support options that are available to them? This is a very important question because when it comes to support coordination, this is a new experience for a lot of families and they don't know exactly what they need to be doing. So by educating and empowering the individuals through information, 
then we're able to teach the families and the individuals about the different types of support options that are available to them. Again, too much information is never enough when it comes to support coordination because the more information you have, the better you can formulate your questions, the better you can seek out the services, and the better you'll work, whether, uh, work better with your support coordinator. Moving on to additional questions for support coordination agencies. Let's talk about ongoing support. How does your support coordinators monitor the quality of supports received and worked? with the individual family and providers to ensure that quality is achieved. Well, when you're in support coordination, they, you have to be monitored on either a monthly basis if, you're, if the individual is living out on their own, or they have to be monitored quarterly, which is every three months at the person's home or day program. And during these monitoring visits, we have um, actual tools or forms that have to be filled out where we ask the basic questions about the services that are being received. All that information is actually put into that form and sent over to DDD for DDD to review if needed. That is how most support coordination, um, support coordinators and support coordination agencies monitor the quality of supports received and how the support coordinator is interacting with the individual. If at any time during these monitoring sessions that anything is brought to the support coordinator's attention, then, like I said, it's added to the form and then it's addressed accordingly in a timely manner. How do you get feedback from the individuals you serve and how do you use this information to improve services? This is an area that a lot of support coordination agencies I don't think have had an opportunity to um, work on just yet. I can let you know that our agency at the moment is developing a basically a survey or a questionnaire so that we can send out to our families on a regular basis so that we can get their feedback and figure out how we can improve our services as a support coordination agency. If you should happen to be with one of those type of agencies, please make sure that you do fill out the, the questionnaire or the survey and send it back because that is the only way support coordination agencies can improve their services. We still have additional questions that you need to ask for uh, as support coordination agencies. How is your agency different from others? How do you stand out from other support coordination agencies? Well, this will be um, a question that you will probably get a lot of different answers from because the agency should be different from other support coordination agencies in regards to the type of services that they can offer. Sure, they can all give support coordination services, but what other things are available? And one of the things you may want to look at is the support coordination agency's website. You may want to check out the website just to see what type of resources or services that they have listed there. Um, if they have any type of alerts or notices, they could be using Twitter or they could have a Facebook page just so that they're able to get that information out to the families or the individuals that they are, are serving. So think of the perks that a support coordination agency can offer you and that will make a determination of how they can stand out from the other support coordination agencies out there that are offering support coordination. Are there, any, are there individuals or families using support coordination services that you can contact as a reference? Earlier I had mentioned that support coordination agencies should have individuals who have given permission to be able to pass out their contact information to new families so they could speak to them about the support coordination agency that they're choosing. These referrals can be very important because a lot of times these individuals or these families can be very honest with you about how, support, how the support coordination agency you've chosen works. If you end up getting any negative feedback from these families, you may want to sit back and think to yourself, maybe the support coordination agency is not the one for me. Other questions specific to your family members' needs and preferences? This simply is stated that if there is anything that you feel like you need to ask that is specific to your family members' needs or preferences, please feel free to ask the support coordination agency. There should be no question that they should shy away from. Now let's talk about the questions to ask your support coordinator. Some of the basic questions that are out there are, how long have you been a support coordinator? 
Well, as I had mentioned earlier, there are new support coordination agencies out there that have just been established this past year. And then there are others that have been working in support coordination for seven years plus. However, that does not necessarily mean that the support coordinator you are receiving has been with that agency that long. So this is a very important question to ask because if you were to ask a um, individual how long have, I mean a support coordinator, how long they have been a support coordinator, it can help you kind of gauge about maybe how much information that individual has that they can share with you. Again, support coordinators go through a lot of different trainings and the more experience they, get, they gain from working with individuals makes them an even more better support coordinator and they are able to link you to the resources and services that you're looking for. How often do you make visits to the individuals on your caseload? Well, support coordinators don't have an option of choosing when they want to visit the individuals they're supporting. They do have mandates from DDD that says they either have to visit them monthly if living on their own, quarterly if they're living in, um, with their family or in a provider agency, um, I'm sorry, within a <coughs> provider-based facility. So, and then you also have to do what we call a one-year anniversary visit to where we actually go through what has happened over the past year, make any changes to the PCPT or the person-centered planning tool, and the NJISP or the in New Jersey Individualized Service Plan. And those are the type of documents and, and, and the consents and stuff that are needed for that anniversary visit. So in, in most circumstances, you're either going to be monitored or visited once a month, every three months, and then you're at least going to get that anniversary visit so that the new plan can be actually, I mean, the old plan can be reviewed and the new plan can be established and uploaded to start the new year with. The next question I would ask the support coordinator are what are the hours that they usually work? Even though the support coordination agency may be open from 8 to 5, your support coordinator may not be available during that time. They could start their day just a little bit later and end their day a little bit later, or they could start their day a little bit earlier and end their day a little bit earlier. So you want to make sure that you know when your support coordinator or their hours um, are so that you know when you're making a phone call to them or reaching out to them to contact them, you'll know if they're available or not. What is your current caseload is a good question. As we have discussed earlier about um, caseloads, if that support coordinator has a very high caseload, it may end up causing you not to get to the, get the attention that you deserve. Now, I'm not going to say that's the case with everyone because, you know, there's a lot of individuals out there who can multitask and make sure that they're covering all their bases. However, again, if the support coordinator does have a high caseload, um, you may not get the actual attention that you deserve. What is your availability in terms of preferred days or times to be contacted? Most support coordination agencies work Monday through Friday. Um, they do have a, a person who is on call for the hours that they're not open. However, again, there could be certain days that the support coordinator could be out on the road visiting families, and they might have set aside one, two, maybe three days a week for what they call their office days. Those would be the preferred times that maybe a support coordinator would rather be contacted. If they're out on the road, they don't have all the information with them about the individual. Um, so it would be better probably to contact that support coordinator when they're in their office. What is the per preferred way to communicate with you? How long should I expect to wait for a response? Two very good questions here. There are several ways that you could communicate with your support coordinator today. The first way is simply by phone, what we're all used to. But now with email available, a lot of support coordinators would like to are attempt to try to communicate with families a lot with email. To be honest with you, email is a wonderful thing in regards to trying to send out information to families and individuals. Um, they could be flyers for events that the individual or family may want to take advantage of. It could just be information that the family would benefit from. So if you have an email address, 
please share it with your support coordinator because that is one way that they can get information about services and supports to you. But if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with your support coordinator, I would always suggest a phone call because that way, to me, speaking to someone one-on-one -on -one lets me know how, much, how important that service is to them, um, how important it is to get that service started to them, and for that matter, you're getting me right on the spot. You're not actually having to sit there and wait for an email response. How long should you wait, uh, expect to wait for the response? Um, that's basically going to be based, um, based upon the support coordination agency's rules and regulations. Um, just to give you an example, my agency, we have a 48-hour rule that if you call and leave a message for one of our support coordinators, they have 48 hours to respond to you. If you haven't heard back from them within 48 hours, I would suggest that you call the support coordination's main number and let someone know that your support coordinator is not um, responding as quickly as you would like them to do. But again, I have to state that the um, Waiting for a response would be a reflection on what the support coordination agency themselves have the rules that they have in place. What is your policy for contact during emergencies? Well, as I mentioned earlier, that all agencies are required to have someone on call. It may not be your actually support coordinator. It could be a rotation, or it could be a supervisor who's handling all the emergency phone calls. So um, with that being said, you should always be able to contact your support coordination agency in, the, in a circumstance of an emergency 24 hours a day. Um, and if the, end, uh, if the agency is using a, um, I'm sorry, I'm at a loss of words, um, a service to which you call in and you leave a message with someone else and they'll contact the actual supervisor on call, um, that's something you may want to consider because there could be a slight delay in that su the supervisor or the support coordinator being on call getting back in touch with you if they're actually going through an answering service. Um, who covers for you when you are unavailable and how do I contact them? This is a very important question, too, because just like anyone else, support coordinators have to take time off from time to time. They may choose to go on vacation, or they may have accumulated enough time that they just need to take off and clear their head and do other personal things. However, when that happens, there should always be someone for you to contact that will be familiar with your case enough that they're able to help you with whatever service or whatever issue that you're working through. Now, in regards to how to contact them, there always should be that main office number. If you're unable to get in contact with your support coordinator, you can call that main office number and someone should be able to track down your support coordinator or find someone who is able to help you. Even more questions to ask a support coordinator. What is your education and background related to working with individuals with disabilities and why did you choose this field of work? A lot of people who are employed through um, support coordination have some type of desire or they could have a family member who, has, who is living with a disability and this is the reason why they chose to go into support coordination. However, there are circumstances where people are hired and they've never had any type of contact with people with disabilities. If that's the case, then through their trainings, they should be able to learn what they need to learn to offer the supports and services that are needed out there. Um, you might also find some support coordinators may not have an actual degree in the field of work that they're in. So um, through DDD, they only require people to have a bachelor's degree and they do not state what that bachelor's degree has to be to be a support coordinator. So don't think that your support coordinator is going to have a degree in some type of human services related field. It could be something completely different. However, they did go through the required DDD trainings and the agency's trainings to become an effective support coordinator. Tell about a time when you successfully helped an individual with disabilities improve her or his quality of life and how were you able to do it. Every agency should have some type of success, success stories. So there's no reason why they can't tell you about the successes that they've had and 
who's to say they may not even tell you, I mean, they may even tell you about some of the unsuccessful attempts that they've had. So if you're able to find a support coordinator who will share information with you, then that's a step in the right direction of building that trust that is needed between the individual family and the support coordinator. The next question, are you familiar with disability rights and protection under the law? This is one of the mandated um, trainings that, you ha that support coordinators have to go through before they can become a support coordinator. They are very familiar with disability rights and they are familiar with the protection laws that are out there for people with disabilities. So it's not a bad question to ask, but the most likely response you will get is that they've been through all the trainings and they've gone through all the um, necessary requirements for them to become a support coordinator. Have you had successful experiences working with the division and other agencies in our, or, and other organizations? Um, this is an important question also to ask because when it comes to support coordination, there is a collaboration between the Division of Developmental Disabilities and all the other provider organizations that are out there. Sure, there may be um, provider organizations that the support coordinator themselves may have not had contact with before how, because there are always new providers being added to the list of qualified providers, um, but um, they should have at least a successful working relationship with the providers out there. Otherwise, um, you could be limited on the number of actual services and supports out there if the support coordinator does not feel comfortable working with certain providers. Describe what you do when you make a visit to an individual. What things do you monitor during a visit? And how much time do you spend with the individual? Where do you prefer to meet the individual? Well, this is a several different questions that we can address. Most of the time, whenever a um, quarterly visit or monthly visit is made, um, there is a form that has to be completed which is called a support coordination monitoring tool and it has specific questions that DDD requires us to ask. However, there could be additional information that the support coordinator will ask so that they can actually update that individualized service plan or the person-centered planning tool or an ELP, an essential lifestyle plan for that matter. Um, so there goes a lot of information sharing and gathering at all the um, actual visits that are made with the individual. What things do you monitor during a visit? Well, other than completing that support coordination monitoring tool and, and always gathering additional information to update the plan of care, um, support coordinators are supposed to be looking at the home environment and making sure that health and safety issues are addressed. If they see that there are any potential problems where health and safety issues could be a problem, then they are required to report that information. However, most support coordinators will talk with the family first and see what the situation is all about, see if there's any type of assistance that they may need to remedy the situation, and then if they see that the situation can't be remedied, then they would reach out to DDD and see if DDD can assist in helping the situation. How much time do you spend with an individual? That's going to depend on the actual support coordination agency and their rules. Um, a lot of times um, they will want to actually make the visit, get done what needs to get done, and exit on because they probably have additional visits to do during the rest of their day. However, a support coordinator should always be available to meet with the, indiv meet with the individual for the amount of time that the individual is requiring. If the individual or family has questions or if they need something more um, explained more in detail, then the, end of the support coordinator should be taking the time to do that. Um, they should not be basically running in and running out. They do get paid for each visit that they actually um, make with the individual and family, and they bill for that to get that reimbursement. So therefore, one, um, they have to report the amount of time that they are visiting with the individual and family to get the actual reimbursement. And where do you prefer to meet with the individual? Well, a lot of times we are required, well, let me not say a lot of times, we are definitely required that at least one visit a year has to be in the individual's home. Remember how I was saying that the support coordinator actually has to address health and safety issues in the environment that the person's living in? Well, then 
by having this visit in their home, they're able to gauge and see if there's any issues that need to be addressed in the home environment. Otherwise, a support coordinator can meet at a day program or a day service. They can attend an IHP meeting at one of those facilities. They can meet you at a restaurant, a fast food place, um, meet you in a park or a library. It doesn't really matter where they meet the individual and the family as long as they're making a face-to-face -face visit so they can gauge what condition the individual is in and then if there's any type of services that need to be given, those type of things can be discussed at any location. However, just to re, um, reaffirm that one visit a year has to be in the individual's home so that we can actually check out the health and safety of the environment. Um, the next question is, what do you see as your role in the individual's life? I think this is one of the most important questions that we've looked at today. And that is, what is going to be the support coordinator's role in the individual's life? The support coordinator should be someone who is dependable, who responds to phone calls or email messages as quick as possible. Um, they need to be someone who can seek out services and get them started whenever the individual wants. So as you can see, the more that the support coordinator is involved in the person's life, the more the role the more bigger the role becomes in the individual's life. Um, we have individuals who actually look forward to seeing our support coordinators as a form of their socialization. And so by being that type of person um, that's so involved, the support coordinator, as I had mentioned earlier, can actually become part of the family or be considered part of the family. Uh, so make sure that this question is one of the ones that you definitely do ask your support coordinator because um, their response can basically gauge what type of um, service you're going to get or, or from that actual support coordinator. So we talked about the um, questions that you need to be asking the support coordination agency and also the support coordinators. Now let's um, talk about the individual's responsibilities. By participating in self-direction, the individual has greater control over the services they receive, how they receive them, and who provides them. With this control, an individual also has the responsibility of managing their services with the support of team of professionals. Since self-direction depends on the active participation of the individual as well as their team of supports, there can be some confusion regarding the responsibilities of the individual. So I would like at this time to give an overview of the individual's responsibilities. The individual's responsibilities. Self-direction depends on the active participation of the individual. The individual will need to be completely involved, especially in the first year. After the first year, the individual will still need to be completely involved. However, since the person-centered plan has been written and approved, revisions to the plan, reviewing and developing outcomes, and the addition and deletion of services are the primary concern. Since the individual has opted to self-direct, they will be researching and choosing their own services. Now, I would like to elaborate on this a little bit. When I say an individual will be researching and, serve, and choosing their own services, that's in collaboration with the support coordinator. I don't want you to think that the individual's sole responsibility is to research and choose their own services because if you don't know where to start to look for the services, it's going to be a very hard um, it's going to be very hard for the individual to find those, those services that are out there, even though there are a lot of tools that DDD offers and also the support coordination agencies. But again, the individual and the support coordinator will work in collaboration to research and choose the services that best, fit, best um, fits the individual's needs. Now, the support coordinator cannot make any determination for the individual. They can only offer the individual options, and the individual and the family will have to choose those options. Um, the support coordinator cannot make any decisions for the individual and themselves. 
The individual will be, will be contacting the agencies directly to inquire about the types of programming they offer and will determine whether it's a good fit for them. The support coordinator can definitely reach out on behalf of the individual and ask questions to the provider or agencies that are out there. However, the best connection is for the individual or family to actually speak with the provider agencies themselves. That way they can ask specific questions that come to their mind and they can make a decision right then and there if that agency is the best agency to move forward with for those supports and services. If the support coordinator is the um, facilitator or mediator between the agency and the individual, there will be a delay in being able to get that information back and forth between the individual and provider. So we always encourage the individual and families to contact that um, service provider or agency first ask their questions, find out the information that they want to know, and if they want to move forward with that provider agency, then contact your support coordinator, and the support coordinator can pick up where the individual and family left off and gather the additional information that needed to actually um, start, uh, pay for, enter, pay for, and start the services. The individual has to negotiate. Now, this also is a situation to where the support coordinator can assist the individual and can try to help the individual negotiate with provider agencies. Contracted vendors have up to rates, meaning that while they have a maximum limit on how much they can charge for a service, they can also work out a deal with the individual and family. They want the business, so talk with them to come up with a mutual agreeable price for services. The goal is to use the assigned budget as efficiently as possible so the individual will have the resources available to create a varied schedule of activities of their choosing. Also, proper pre-planning of expenses will prevent overages in the budget and will ensure that the dollars stretch for the entire year. Now, um, you heard me say that the agencies have a maximum limit that they'll charge, and a lot of times that's the first figure that agencies will give you when you start discussing the cost of services. However, if you have a budget based upon your individual's needs, then therefore you may have to realize that you may need to negotiate with those agencies to see if they would be willing to provide those services at a lower cost. That way you're able to purchase more services from the budget that's been assigned to you. If you go with their first um, quote, then it could possibly limit you to only one or two, possibly three services for the year, whereas again, with that budget, you want to try to stretch that money out and accomplish as many services and supports as you possibly can. The individual will have to continuously follow up with agencies that are providing the services. Now, this statement here again, I will have to say that support coordinator will be working with the individual on this, but we do try to empower the individual to take charge of their plan. So we do encourage the individual to um, continuously stay in contact with the agency that is actually providing the supports. If there's something that they have a question about, it's better to go straight to the source. Go to that agency and ask them that question. Otherwise, again, if the, the support coordinator is going to be the facilitator or mediator, there could be a delay in getting that information back to you as it travels from one person to the next. The individual is required to sign off on monthly vouchers from the agency so they can get paid. This is a requirement. If you're purchasing a service from an agency, they do have timesheets or vouchers that have to be completed, and they have to be signed off by the individual, family, or the guardian so that they can actually submit that voucher, those timesheets, to DDD to get reimbursed for. So it will be the individual or family's responsibility to sign off on those monthly, monthly vouchers or timesheets so that the agencies can be paid. At any time the individual feels dissatisfied with the services provided, they can decide to end the services. That's the wonderful thing about self-direction. Back in the past, whenever family wanted services, basically they were put into a contract and they were stuck there unless they could literally show the division that they needed to change their agencies because the agency wasn't providing what they thought was best for their loved one or individual. With self-direction, if you don't like the service, if you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it, or that the individual is not benefiting from anything, then you can end the service. 
just contact your, um, the support coordinator, let them know you're going to be ending the service. And then again, to empower the individual to take charge of their plan, individual and family can call the agency or the organization and end their services. The individual should communicate any changes with the support coordinator. Now this one here I'm really going to have to stress to you because the individual will be communicating any changes with the support coordinator who will be the primary contact of your team of supports. Please make sure that support coordinator is contacted before starting a new service. If you end the service, you could wait a while to tell the support coordinator. And when I say that, you shouldn't wait too long. But it's not one of those things to where I end the service and I have to contact the support coordinator right then and there. You could contact them the next day if need be. However, if you're waiting on a service and you've talked to an agency who's going to be providing that service, you do have to communicate with your support coordinator because there's things the support coordinator actually has to do before they, that individual can start attending or receiving that service. Those kind of things that I'm talking about literally is that they have to contact the provider, make sure that the provider does have um, the capability to offer the services to the individual. They need to check rates and see what the going rate is going to be for the service. They have to enter that rate into what we call that I record or the E record so services can be paid for using the budget. They also have to update that PCPT or the NJISP um, and upload that to the I record to for the services to begin. So as you can see, there's a lot of steps that the support coordinator has to make to start an actual service. And that's why we strongly caution for families or individuals not to start a service until they have received the okay from their support coordinator. Now, that does not mean that you can call the support coordinator, leave them a message, and start the service the next day. You literally have to get a confirmation from the support coordinator that you can start the services. If you don't, the services cannot be paid out of the budget until it's approved by the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And therefore, if the individual starts attending the program or receives the services before then, the individual will be responsible for the expenses. That is an awful thing when that happens, that when families get so proactive that they actually jump out there and start a service and then they'll contact the support coordinator. For, for that matter, sometimes they'll forget to contact the support coordinator. And usually upon a quarterly visit or in a conversation on the telephone, the support coordinator will find out that the service is being delivered. And there really is no way to recapture that um, time period that the services were delivered because DDD does not like for us to backdate. Um, in the new system of payment that they're putting into place, there is no backdating. So literally, if a family or an individual started a service before getting the confirmation from the support coordinator, then the family or individual will be charged for that service. Now, the services that a lot of individuals take advantage of they are not cheap services. So before you know it, you can rack up a very high cost. And I have known families who've had to take loans out to pay for services that they did not get authorized first to start. And it was a very sad situation seeing that happen. So again, I'm just going to reiterate to you that if an individual starts attending a program or receives services before the support coordination confirmation, then the individual will be responsible for those services or for the cost of those services. So where are the resources and services that are out there? <clears throat> well, on one of the beginning slides, there were actually um, I was telling you that they are a list of support coordination agencies that can be downloaded from the DDD website. And so that's a form of service that you can access or a resource that shows you a list of services that are out there. But there also is a list of qualified providers out there. And when I mention qualified providers, I'm meaning that these are agencies that have actually gone through the qualifying process of DDD to be able to accept the money that is within a budget. So let's take a look and see where possibly we could find resources and services.
There are many resources for finding the services and supports that an individual may need. The primary resource of the individual should be uh, that the individual should use is their support coordinator. Support coordinators work on a daily basis with agencies that provide services throughout the state of New Jersey. The support coordinator can provide the individual with a list of qualified agencies that can be used to research the desired services. The list is constantly growing as more and more agencies are becoming qualified to provide services for individuals who are choosing to self-direct. Another resource is information and referral agencies. Information and referral agencies are common resources. Information and referral agencies are sometimes referred to as one-stop shops as they may offer or link individuals with needed services by identifying their needs, finding the most appropriate services to meet their needs, and linking them to the most appropriate service providers. The internet is a resource that most people use on a daily basis. Browsing the internet can provide the individual and family with a lot of services. However, the individual should keep in mind that not all agencies are qualified to provide services using the self-directed budget. If the individual finds an agency that is not qualified, then she or he should talk to their support coordinator about getting the agency qualified to provide the desired services. These agencies that you may find out in your communities, you could actually have those agencies qualified if the agencies choose to do so. All they have to do is basically um, reach out to the Division of Developmental Disabilities, fill out some paperwork that is needed, and they can actually become a qualified provider. You may want to talk to um, businesses and organizations out in your community about becoming qualified providers because it's actually um, secure funding. If the person actually utilizes the service, then the organization or agency is guaranteed to be paid for that service. So if there is an actual organization, business, or agency that is not listed on that qualified provider list that your support coordinator can offer you, then please feel free to let the support coordinator know about the agency or business that you would like to have qualified, and the support coordinator will actually contact that agency or business and, and help them through the process of becoming a qualified provider. Conferences, workshops, and expos are a wonderful resource. By attending conferences, workshops, and expos, the individual can find out about current trends and new services available. Many times agencies are presenters at said venues and they discuss the services they have to offer. Most conferences, workshops, and expos all have areas that are designed to be agencies and the services that they would like to provide. Networking can be a valuable resource. A lot of times families and individuals will, realize, uh, will overlook the whole network, networking aspect. Talking with other people who are utilizing services can be very beneficial. They can offer referrals and give opinions based off of their own personal experiences. So if you um, have that Facebook page, um, that's the type of form of networking that you could reach out to families who are possibly serving um, or are receiving services from agencies. Um, you can also at the conferences, workshop, and expos, rub elbows with people as we say so, and network with them and find out about the type of services they are receiving. And you can also get an idea about the agencies that are providing those services to the people. And last but not, not necessarily not least, our families and friends. They can be an actually they can be a overlooked resource. You should reach out to family and friends and ask them if they are aware of any desired services. They may have heard of through conversations or seen an advertisement services that the individual is looking for. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times that I don't have the opportunity to just go out into my community and look around. Instead, I have to rely on other people who is telling me what it was that new store that opened down the street or what was that new organization that's offering that service. So by connecting with my family and my friends, I'm able to get information that are locally to me and it helps me in the decision making process of trying to find those services and supports that I'm looking for.
most of this information that I share with you today in this webinar is information presented um, by or is derived from information and material resources from Caregivers of New Jersey Support Coordination, as well as the following valuable resources. The Bog Center on Developmental Disabilities, which is affiliated with Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. New Jersey, um, they offer a lot of different tools and resources that you can download from their site. Another is the New Jersey Department of Human Services, the Division of Developmental Disabilities, or DDD. By visiting their website, you will find a lot of information on there that you can use that, again, that was pulled from for this webinar today. Um, I would suggest that you request a copy of Selecting a Support Coordination Agency, Making Choices, Becoming Empowered, A Guide for Families from the Bog Center on Developmental Disabilities, and also the flyer Timeline for 2014 Graduates to Access Services and Supports After Graduation from the Division of Developmental Disabilities as part of your continued planning. These tools are wonderful resources and they actually go a little bit more in detail in certain areas and also give you more type of tools you can use in regards to trying to map out the individual or your loved one's life. At this point I would like to open up our webinar to any questions that are out there and I will see if I can answer those questions and give you the information that you're needing. Trace, thank you so much. Um, and I just, before we get to the questions, we actually do have quite a few. Um, we do have numerous requests for specific links and copies of the PowerPoint. I do want to let everyone know that this session will be archived on the Family Support Center of New Jersey website, which is fscnj.org, along with the Transition Matters website. That is transitionmattersnj.org for those resources. Trace, for your first question, at what point after completing the DDRT do you find out your budget and who has these numbers? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question again? Sure. At what point after completing the DDRT do you find out your budget and who has these numbers? Um, the actual, the New Jersey Institute of Technology is the um, the organization that contacts families in regards to doing the disabilities um, resource tool. And once you go through the phone interview and answer their questions, they can't give you the information right then on the phone, but you would receive a letter in the mail or either your support coordinator will actually reach out to you and let you know what your budget is. So I can't give a specific timeline on that because sometimes the NJIT can get backed up on their um, DDRTs and it can cause a delay, but if you have your support coordinator on board, they can start houndering um, um, NJIT so that we, or DDD so that we could get that DDRT so we can move forward in the planning process. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, my son graduates in June and I have not received a budget yet. Can I start looking for a coordinator now, or do I need to wait? Actually, you can go ahead and start looking for a support coordination agency now. Um, the rules for DDD at this point is 60 days before the graduation date. You can actually start um, doing your researching and filling out the support coordination agency selection form and send that into DDD. And if you do have a support coordination agency that you prefer, they will assign you to that support coordination agency. If you say that you don't know of an agency that you can choose from, then they will automatically assign you and then the support coordination agency will reach out to you either by phone or by mail and start the process of gathering the information and planning out the services and supports that are needed. Trace, can you share what counties um, Caregivers of New Jersey is currently serving? One of the families wanted to know. Um, I tell you what, give me a moment and I'll come back to that question, okay? Perfect, thank you. Um, and I'll, have to pull, I'll have to pull my little flyer thing here off uh, my computer to actually name off the counties. The reason why I can't answer that question right off the bat is we actually used to be a statewide agency and since our parent company, the Family Resource Network, also offers services and supports here in the state of New Jersey, there is a conflict-free policy that DDD put in the place that if an agency offers supports and services, they also cannot support um, offer support coordination in that county. So that is why um, caregivers of New Jersey had to pull back from 
the whole statewide and being in every county in New Jersey because FRN is actually offering supports and services some of those counties. So FRN has given us specific counties that we can now offer support coordination in. It's just right off the top of my head. I can't name those off and I will definitely pull that information before we end the webinar today and let that person know what counties we do cover. Perfect. Thank you for offering that clarity. Um, Trace, is there a time limit for support coordinators to spend with the family before writing an ISP? My support you know coordinator, what? I'm sorry, the second That's part right. was that, uh, that this specific support coordinator said she can only spend one hour. No, no, there should not be a time limit on that at all. That, again, is falling on the support coordination agency themselves about their rule and regulations of how much time their support coordinators can spend with them. Um, usually on the initial home visit, we will spend up to an hour to two hours um, gathering information so that we can complete that person-centered planning tool and then move on to the NJISP, which is the Individualized Service Plan, which actually states the services that the person wants. But we can make multiple visits and spend multiple hours with the individual actually constructing that plan. And, and to be honest with you, we are starting to see that maybe um, families need additional assistance in trying to plan or create a roadmap for their loved one's life. So there are other tools out there that the support coordination agencies can use, such as we call them PATHS, P-A-T-H, or MAPS, M-A-P-S. And these sometimes can take two to three hours with a group of individuals um, who are wanting to be supports for the individual that is seeking those services. We can sit down and map out a whole road map or a direction of where that individual wants to go. So there should not be a limitation on how much time the support coordinator can actually spend with the individual. If anything, if the support coordinator sees that they may have overbooked themselves in a day and can only allow a certain amount of time with that individual, then the individual needs to request for that support coordinator to schedule another time with them so that they can finish up the information and gathering process. Perfect. And Trace, I want to give you two more questions before we end the session. Um, when contacting the agency for emergencies, is there any standards of what is considered an emergency? Well, first, I'm so glad that someone asked this question because if you simply want to change a service, that is something that most of the answering services or the supervisor will wait and contact the support coordinator the next day. However, if we see that there is a hospitalization, a homeless situation, um, then that would constitute an emergency. Anything that is dealing with health and safety for the individual would be an emergency situation that the support coordination agency would have to deal with. Otherwise, if it's just my support coordinator hasn't called me back or, you know, I want to change this service instead of going to this service, a lot of times that will, that's not deemed an emergency and a follow-up call will be made the next day. Perfect. And the next question is, I've, I've heard it takes a while for the flow of money to begin. What happens if the child graduates and there's no funding coming through? Can a family pay up front if the program has been approved and get reimbursed? Um, no, actually, there's no reimbursement for the family in regards to the budget that is assigned to the individual. And again, I'm glad this question was asked because when an individual budget is assigned, it can only be dispersed to agencies or qualified um, providers such as a self-hire. Um, for reimbursement. The families actually never can pay for something and receive money back for whatever they paid for. Now, if the money is running slow, so to say, and it is actually becoming a barrier for the individual starting services and they're just sitting at home doing nothing and, you know, basically making their life miserable, um, there are things that we can do to try to speed up the process but there is no reimbursement out of the budget whatsoever. Think of the budget as being like a debit card in a sense that there's no actual money ever exchanging hands. Everything is done electronically. So if a family would like to start services before they are actually assigned a budget at DDD, they could pay out of their pocket, but they would not be reimbursed. So if they are going to purchase a service, they should probably pit, um, purchase the minimum amount of that service until the budget kicks in and can pick up and pay for the service. 
And Trace, I actually have um, one more question that's a little bit different, so I, I do want to ask it if you don't mind. Um, sure. If an individual is nonverbal and cannot say what they like or want to do, what options are available? Um, well, that's where we turn to the guardian or the people that know the individual the best. Um, so they can actually speak for the individual and we can gather that information from the guardian, the family member, or even a best friend for that matter. So even if the individual doesn't have an actual voice for themselves, we still can gather that information. Um, also I would like to throw out there that you know, everybody has a form of communication, so if they're not able to verbally say what they want, we can look at that behavior, um, what we call those, those um, nonverbal behaviors, so to say, and we can kind of help determine if that's something that the individual actually would like to have or not based upon their body language that they're giving us or if they're seeming to be irritated or upset at the moment about something, then that would kind of give us a clue that maybe that's not the service that the individual wants. But ultimately we would, even though we put the individual in the center and want to deliver the service that that individual wants, if they cannot actually speak for themselves or we can't read that body language, so to say, then we do have to rely on the guardian of that individual to tell us what type of services that they feel is best needed for their loved one. Perfect. And Trace, did you want a couple of seconds to pull up the, the map of the counties that caregivers yes, serve? Yes, I want to just, yeah, let me grab my laptop real quick and I can definitely give you those, those um, counties. Perfect. Thank you. And again, everyone, we will have all this information archived on our website. Um, we will also make sure that you have uh, the information. You can actually access the caregiver's website to um, access the counties that will be served um, through the um, Family Support Center of New Jersey's, um, which is, again, fscnj.org. The counties that Caregivers of New Jersey is, is currently um, serving is Atlantic County, Cape May County, Cumberland County, Hudson County, Hunterdon County, Passaic County, Mercer County, Sussex County, and Warren. Trace, as always, thank you again for taking the time to share this information with everyone in attendance. And to everyone out there, thank you for joining us for this evening's session. We encourage you to explore the TransitionMattersNJ.org website for any archive sessions that we may have, in-person trainings that are coming up, and any future webinars surrounding the topic of transition. From the staff at the Family Support Center of New Jersey and Trace Baxter, please have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Trace.